back, adventurers, to another exciting episode of Raiding the Tomb. For this episode, we travel back to 1956 to a scene of maritime disaster. Join me as we board a ship filled with jewels, gorgeous music, and Italian artistry, but also danger. Tonight, we board the Andrea Doria, the pride of the Italian cruise fleet as she steams towards doom and disaster. Before we check in our boarding pass, make sure to follow my good friend and sponsor, Sea Jack Productions on YouTube, to catch this episode, as well as old episodes of this podcast in video form. The whistle blows as we and dozens of other people from around the world board the newest ship in the Italian's pleasure cruise fleet. The SS Andrea Doria was an ocean liner for the Italian line Societa di Navigazione Italia home ported in Genoa, Italy. However, it is best known for its sinking in 1956, where 1,706 passengers and crew, 1,660 were rescued, while 46 passengers and crew lost their lives. Named after the 16th century Genoese Admiral Andrea Doria, the ship had a gross register tonnage of 29,100 and a capacity of about 1,200 passengers and 500 crew. For a country attempting to rebuild its shattered economy and reputation after World War II, Andrea Doria was an icon of Italian national pride. Of all of Italy's ships at the time, Andrea Doria was the largest, fastest, and supposedly the safest. Where have we heard that before? Launched on 16th of June, 1951, the ship began her maiden voyage on the 14th of January, 1953. On the 25th of July, 1956, while Andrea Doria was approaching the coast of Nantucket, Massachusetts, bound for New York City, the eastbound Stockholm of the Swedish-American line collided with her in one of history's most infamous maritime disasters. Struck in the side, the top-heavy Andrea Doria immediately started to list severely to starboard, which left half of her lifeboats unusable. The consequent shortage of lifeboats could have resulted in significant loss of life, but the ship thankfully stayed afloat for over 11 hours after the collision. The calm, appropriate behavior of the crew, together with improvements in communication and the rapid response of other ships, averted a disaster similar in scale to that of Titanic in 1912. While 1,660 passengers and crew were rescued and survived, unfortunately, 46 people on the ship passed as a direct consequence of the collision. The evacuated luxury liner capsized and sank the following morning. This accident remains the worst maritime disaster to occur in the United States waters since the capsizing of the Eastland in Chicago in 1915. Perhaps that's another episode we should do. The incident and its aftermath were heavily covered by the news media. While the rescue events were both successful and commendable, the cause of the collision with Stockholm and the loss of the Andrea Doria generated much interest in the media and many lawsuits. Largely because of an out-of-court settlement agreement between the two shipping companies during hearings immediately after the disaster. No determination of cause was ever formally published. Although greater blame appeared initially to fall on the Italian liner, more recent discoveries have indicated that a misreading of radar on the Swedish ship initiated the collision course, leading to errors on both ships. Though not the largest or the fastest ocean liner of its era, the 697-foot Andrea Doria was widely regarded as the most beautiful. Its decks were dotted with three outdoor swimming pools, and it was dubbed a floating art gallery for its dazzling array of paintings, tapestries, and surrealist murals. There was even a life-sized bronze statue of the ship's namesake, a 16th century Genoese navigator. Equally impressive were the Doria safety features. It boasted two radar screens, a relatively new technology on ocean liners, and its hull was divided into 11 watertight compartments. Anxious travelers could also take solace in the president of Captain Piero Calamai, a venerable Italian mariner and veteran of both World War I and World War II. The Doria safely completed 100 transatlantic crossings between 1953 and 1956, and it initially seemed that its 101st would be no different. 
After leaving Italy on July 17, 1956, the ship stopped at three ports in the Mediterranean and then steamed into the open ocean on a nine-day voyage to New York City. Along with 572 crew members, it held 1,134 passengers, ranging from Italian immigrant families to business travelers, vacationers, and even a few notables such as Hollywood actress Ruth Roman. On July 25th, the Doria entered heavily trafficked sea lanes off the northeast coast of the United States. The passenger liner Stockholm departed New York on a voyage to its home port of Gothenburg. By around 10.30 p.m., the two ships were approaching one another from opposite directions off Nantucket. Neither was following the established rules of the road for ocean travel. Despite sailing in heavy fog, Captain Calipai had ordered only a minor reduction in speed to stay on schedule for an early morning arrival in New York. Stockholm, meanwhile, was steaming north of the recommended eastbound route in the hope of shaving time off its journey. Around 10.45 p.m., Calamai's radar picked up a blip representing Stockholm. The Swedish vessel, under the watch of the third officer, Johan Ernst Karstens Johansson, spotted the dory on its own radar a few minutes later. It was a situation both had encountered countless times, yet on this occasion, the two ships somehow came into opposite conclusions about one another's location. Karstens plotted the Doria to his left and prepared to pass port to port while Calamai, fixing Stockholm's location to his right, maneuvered for a far more unconventional unconventional, starboard-to-starboard passage. One of the men, it's still not certain who, had had misread his radar and inadvertently steered his ship towards the other. The officers didn't realize that they were on a collision course until shortly after 11.10 p.m. when Calamai finally spotted Stockholm's lights through a thick curtain of fog. She's coming right at us! One Doria officer shouted. With just moments to spare, Calamai ordered a hard left turn in an attempt to outrun the other ships. Karstens, having spotted the Doria, tried to reverse his propellers and slow down, but it was too late. Stockholm's icebreaker bow crashed into the Andrea Doria starboard side like a battering ram, snapping bulkheads and penetrating some 30 feet into its hull. It remained lodged there for a few seconds, then broke loose, leaving a gaping hole in the side of the Doria. On board Andrea Doria, passengers felt a tremendous jolt accompanied by the sound of clanging metal. Actress Ruth Roman describes hearing a big explosion like a firecracker in one of the lounges. The ship's orchestra was playing the song Arrivederci Roma when they were abruptly hurled from their stage by the force of the crash. Those who only ended up with scrapes and bruises could consider themselves fortunate. The collision killed five people on board the Stockholm and dozens more on the Doria, which had seen a large section of its starboard side turned into twisted metal. Italian immigrant Maria, Sergio, and her four young children all perished on impact as they slept. In another cabin, Brooklyn resident Walter Carlin discovered that the exterior wall of his room had been completely sheared off. His wife, who had been reading in bed, had simply disappeared. By far the most extraordinary story concerned Linda Morgan, who was sleeping in a starboard side cabin. The crash killed her stepfather and stepsister, but Morgan was somehow lifted from her bed and thrown onto the crumpled bow of the Stockholm, where she landed with only a broken arm. I was on the Andrea Doria, she told the astonished Stockholm sailor who found her. Where, where am I now? Following the shock of the collision, both crews scrambled to take stock of their vessels. While Stockholm was found to be in no danger of sinking, the Doria had sustained critical damage and was listing over 20 degrees to its starboard side, allowing seawater to spill through its watertight compartments. Calamay resigned himself to abandoning ship, but soon encountered a catastrophic problem. The list was so bad that the Doria's eight side port side lifeboats could no longer be launched. The remaining starboard side craft could only carry around a thousand of the ship's passenger and crew. Here! Danger! Immediate! Andrea Doria radioed. Need lifeboats! As many as possible! Can't use our lifeboats! Though help was soon to arrive, the situation among the Doria remained perilous. 
Debris from the collision had trapped some of the passengers in their cabins, and many on the lower decks had to brave smoke-filled hallways and knee-deep water on their way back to the main deck. Those who gathered by the useless portside lifeboats faced their own set of problems. With the Doria listing to its right, its main deck had turned into a steep, slippery slope. To reach the starboard side lifeboats, many had to lie on their backs and slide down the deck, making sure to stop before they careened off the edge and into the water. All the while, the ship continued to roll, threatening to capsize at any moment. The rescue, one of the largest in maritime history, lasted several hours, but by 5.30 a.m., nearly all of the Doria's survivors had been evacuated. 753 people were placed aboard the Ile de France, with the rest scattered aboard the Stockholm and four other vessels. Captain Calamai seemed ready to go down with his ship, but reluctantly boarded the last lifeboat after his crew refused to leave him behind. A few hours later, as the rescue fleet steamed towards New York Harbor, Andrea Doria finally capsized and flooded. At 10.09 a.m., her gaping hulk disappeared beneath the Atlantic. All told, 51 had died as a result of the collision, 5 on the Stockholm and 46 on the Doria. The ship's owners both blamed the other for the, tra for the tragedy, excuse me. but following an out-of-court settlement, a trial was averted and neither was officially held responsible. In the years since, investigators have used crew depositions and computer simulations to try and recreate the night of the disaster. While there were obvious mistakes from both ships, many researchers now believe that the Karstens made the crucial error by misreading his radar and concluded that the Doria was several miles farther away than it actually was. Nevertheless, debate over the cause of the wreck continues even today. Stockholm was eventually repaired. Andrea Doria, meanwhile, rests in some 240 feet of water in the North Atlantic. It has become a hollowed site among scuba divers who call it the Mount Everest of diving, but poor visibility and unpredictable currents have ensured that 60-year-old wreck is still claiming lives. Since 1956, over a dozen people have perished while trying to explore its watery grave. Well, as our lifeboat rocks and sways into the path of the oncoming Coast Guard ships, it appears we have survived our journey across the Atlantic in the Andrea Doria. Join me next week as we raid another tomb in search of truth and adventure. And remember to follow my good friend and sponsor, Sea Jack Productions, to see this episode as well as older ones and a plethora of awesome geek content. Until next time, my friends.